Vision Sunday, yeah, thank you so much. I've brought out the new uh, kicks for Vision Sunday. Come on, somebody. We're going to celebrate today. Come on. Hey, listen, uh, before I I jump into this, maybe you're new around here, and I just want to thank you so much for being here today. Maybe this is your very first time. Uh, This message is a little bit different uh, than any other weekend. This is a message from a pastor to his church, those that are really part of what God is doing here, and if you're here kind of just with lots of questions and discovering faith, and I can't think of a better weekend for you to sit in and listen to this, this message, but this is really a message from a pastor to his people. And uh, before I get into this whole thing on Vision Sunday, I want to I tell you a, a story first about a boy named Michael. Uh, this boy, uh, he was born on January 15th, uh, 1929, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he was born uh, in an old Victorian-style home that belonged to his grandmother. Uh, the house was located on Auburn Avenue. He was the second of three children. Uh, His parents originally named him Michael, uh, but later, uh, after his own father, but later his own father changed not only his son's name, but his name as well. Uh, The boy was a, he was a son of a preacher. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. His great-grandfather was a preacher. So he grew up in in a godly home filled with love and, and support. And uh, he also grew up at that time period in an era of deep uh, racial uh, discrimination and segregation. And he encountered um, racism at a very, very early age. When he was only six years old, uh, he had a buddy that he played with, and he was a little white kid. And uh, almost every day they'd play together all summer long. Uh, That little white boy didn't live in his neighborhood. Uh, His dad owned a a store across the street. So he'd go to work with his dad every day and he'd end up playing uh, with his buddy. And they played together all summer long and they became really good friends. But summer ended and it was time to go back to school. And this little boy couldn't go to school with his white friend because his white friend went to a white-only school. In fact, this little boy had to go to a black-only school. And it really broke his heart. What made it worse is that his friend's father demanded that his son would no longer be able to play with with his black friend. It broke his heart even further. And for the very first time, this little boy's mother had to sit down with him and explain to him the history of slavery and racism and segregation in America. And it broke his little heart. He knew something was wrong. He couldn't understand it. But he, he, as he started to grow, he, he experienced more uh, racial injustice. His dad one day took him to buy a pair of new shoes. So they went downtown to the shoe store in Atlanta, and, and they sat on the first available bench to, to uh, buy a pair of shoes. And the salesman came up to him and to his father and said, look, sir, I'd be happy to sell you a pair of shoes, but you need to sit on the bench back there. And his father said, no, 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 we're quite comfortable right where we are. Uh, I'm happy just to, you know, buy a pair of shoes sitting here. He said, no, 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 sir, I, I cannot sell you a pair of shoes until you move to the bench back there. The little boy could see the, the anger and the hurt in his father's eyes. And his father looked at the salesman and said, I will either buy a pair of shoes sitting right here, sir, or I will not buy a pair of shoes at all in this store. And th- with that, he grabbed his little son's hand and They walked out of the shoe store. And that little boy heard his father say, and he could see the anger in his his eyes and just hear the hurt in his heart. He said, son, I don't know how long this system of racial injustice will last, but I will never accept it. And from that moment, those words shaped this little boy's conscience. He began to understand things were not as they were should be. Things were not as they should be. And as he began to grow older, he began to experience other forms of racial inequality. In fact, when he was uh, attending high school, Booker T. Washington High School, he and his teacher, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bradley, they decided to go uh, uh, and, and compete at a speech competition because this little boy had started to become a little preacher of his own. 
And he started to develop these great oratory skills, just like his daddy and his granddaddy and his great-granddaddy. Well, they they took a bus ride 90 miles uh, outside of uh, Atlanta to the competition where he came in second place, and he was so excited to get home and and to tell his mother and father the good news. Well, that joy was only short-lived because as they sat on on the city bus on the way back to Atlanta, two other white passengers got onto the bus, and the bus driver stopped and said to him and his teacher, Mrs. Bradley, you need to get up and stand in the aisle and give your seat to these white men. Well, that boy sat there as a high school student. He said, I'm not budging. I'll sit here all night long. And just before a confrontation broke out, uh, at the urging of Mrs. Bradley, and out of respect for her, and at the time, the law, he decided to stand up, and he and Mrs. Bradley stood for 90 miles in the aisle while everyone else sat. It broke his heart. He knew this was not as it should be. This was not as it could be. Experiencing this kind of injustice that he couldn't go and and swim in a white-only pool. He couldn't sit at a a so-called white-only lunch counter, that he couldn't uh, uh, attend a a white-only school. He knew things were not as they could be, and it broke his heart. But something significant changed. The summer between after he graduated from Booker T. Washington High School and before he would go on to Morehouse College, uh, his family sent him up here to the north, to Connecticut, where he would work all summer long on a tobacco farm to make some extra money. And when he was here in the north, he had witnessed for the first time how things could be, how things should be. He joined a church up in Connecticut, and for the first time, he worshiped right alongside white people. They loved him, and they accepted him. He preached that in that church all summer long. It was the first time he said, oh, It was something shifted inside of his spirit as to what could be, what should be. All summer long, he ate at any lunch counter he wanted to eat at right next to white people. He rode any bus he wanted to ride, and he sat wherever he wanted to sit right next to white people who loved him and accepted him for who he was. But alas, that summer came to an end, and he had to go back down south to the land of Jim Crow. And once again, it broke his heart. But while he was in college, um, while he was in college, he, he began to find some other people there uh, that were very serious about um, racial equality for all. He remembered as a boy when, when um, he first learned that he couldn't attend that white school with his white friend. He said he made a decision in his heart that from that moment on, he was gonna hate all the white people. But his father, he remembered, sat him down, he said, son, no, 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 no. As followers of Jesus, we are to hate no man. We're to love everyone, even our enemies. And so as he was in college and he was wrestling with this and he heard a lot of of hate speech and vitriol from his other friends, but he was convinced while he was in college that the only way to change the system was not with hate because hate could not defeat hate. Only love could defeat hate. And he made a decision that the only way to change the system was through love because hate was just too heavy a burden to carry. And he knew that it would only be through nonviolent protests, civil protests, that that things could truly change. And his message, uh, he began to speak up and stand up for for things that he couldn't sit idly by and and watch this injustice. And people began to hear his message and it became very attractive and he started to build quite a, a following. And he appealed especially to those in the north that were white and those especially that were followers of Jesus, Christians. He also began to appeal to the American ideals and values of liberty and justice, freedom for all. In fact, he and many, many others uh, began the civil rights movement 
They recognized him as, his, as their leader, and it all culminated uh, on a march that led to Washington, where 250,000 people showed up to hear him speak. And he spoke the words of a man with a broken heart. And this is what he had to say. Of course, we know that man to be one of the greatest men that have ever walked the planet, the great Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He would go on and lead the civil rights movement, and for his work, he would be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. He was so committed to eradicating racial, eradicating racial discrimination that he was willing to give his life for it, and he did. For on April 4th, 1968, he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King, uh, if he were alive today, would be 91 years old, had his life not been cut short. But he lived every day of his life to the full because he was a man of vision. You say, what is a vision? Where does it come from? Vision is born in the soul of a man or a woman or a child who is consumed with the tension between what is and what could be. Vision is, for Dr. King, was, was this uh, burden for racial equality that his children wouldn't have to grow up in a world that would judge them by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. You see, vision, it forms in the, in the heart of those who are dissatisfied with the status quo. And like his father, Dr. King said, this should not be. There's a better way to live. There's a better way to treat one another. And I don't know how long this system is going to last, but I will never, ever accept it. You see, vision flows out of a heart that breaks for something or for someone. And his heart broke for people that were suffering injustice. His heart broke for people who were um, experiencing racial inequality. His heart broke for the picture of a preferred future where we could love one another. You know, Dr. King experienced what I would refer to as a Popeye moment. Anybody remember Popeye? That beloved cartoon character, you know, Popeye, the sailor man. It's one of my favorites growing up. He had a girlfriend. Anybody remember what her name was? Olive, that's right, Olive, right? And every time, like, Popeye would get really, like, you know, angry or frustrated with what was and what could be, he'd, he'd look at his girlfriend, Olive, and he said, I've had all I can stands, and I can't stands no more. You see, Dr. King had that Popeye moment. He said, I've had all I can stand, I can't stand any more. It's what I would refer to as uh, a holy discontent. A holy discontent is this, it's a righteous anger. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling where your heart breaks for something or for someone. It's this, it's this idea that there's more to life than this that we're experiencing right here and right now that you can't stand idly by anymore, that this holy discontent, it requires an individual to act and to do something about it. And for Dr. King, his vision for, was for racial equality. And some of you might say, hey, pastor, hey, Dave, what is your vision in light of all of that? What is your vision for community church? Like, what is your holy discontent? What is the thing that keeps you up at night? What is the thing that drives you to your knees in prayer for our church, for our community, 
and for the Poconos. So here it is. This is my vision for Community Church. The vision is you. The vision is you living a fully surrendered life for Jesus. Surprise! That's the vision. You're like, and you're like, that's all? No, no, no. That's everything. This vision is, is, it's, it's not about a building or campuses or making this a bigger church or better than the one down the street. The vision for community church is you living a fully surrendered life for Jesus. The vision is not about a program, it's about a person, and that person is you. It's you living a life fully surrendered to God. This vision of this church, don't get confused, you come here on the weekend, this, this is, and maybe that's all you might do, and I'm so glad that you're here, but this vision isn't about just growing a bigger or better church, it's not about programs, it's not, it's not about you know, glitzy and glamour and hype and bigger you know, light shows and, and greater music, no, no, no. This vision is not about just the, you know, you know, you know, pizzazz and sizzle and sex appeal, no, this vision is about you going all in for Jesus and fully surrendering your life. Come on to the one that died for you and gave everything for you. How in the world could I, as your pastor, expect you to hold anything back for the one that held nothing back for you? That he denied himself and he picked up his cross and he went up on Calvary and he, he died a humiliating death. He was nailed to that Roman blood-stained cross. How could I expect, how could any of I, us expect if we consider ourselves to be followers of Jesus to hold anything back from the one who held nothing back from us? I mean, friend, listen to me. I told you this is for church people, so if you're like just kind of listen, just listen in. How could we ever have an argument when we stand before him one day that would ever just not sound stupid or silly if we're holding back the stuff in our life for the one who gave it all. I mean, what kind of preacher would I, what kind of pastor would I be to not challenge you to live a fully surrendered life? Jesus didn't go to a bloodstained cross and leave an empty, grain, uh, empty grave so that you and I could just live this compartmentalized, comfortable, cozy, compromising form of Christianity. I mean, Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could like play hokey pokey Christianity. You ever meet a hokey pokey Christian? You know, you put your right foot in, you put your right foot out, you put your right foot in, and you shake it all about. So I come to church and I kind of put my right foot in and then I put my right hand in and I shake it all about. But then on Monday, I take it out and I just live however I want to live. I do whatever I want to do just to go back to church and do my little hokey pokey. Jesus didn't, come on. Jesus, it's not what he called us to do. It's not what Jesus was about. This vision is for each of you to live a fully surrendered life for Jesus. And I have this holy discontent in my heart that some of you may not be experiencing what Jesus referred to as life to the full. Life to the full. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says this, the thief, who's the thief? That's the enemy of our soul. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. But I, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Listen, when you find Jesus, come on, you find life. You find life to the full. You find life in abundance. That you would live a life to the full. That you'd go all in for Jesus you would hold nothing back, not your time, not your talents, not your treasures, not even your plans for your future, that you would hold nothing back for him. So surprise, here's the big vision, it's you, living a fully surrendered life. 
I mean, it's you. It's you, Matt. It's you, Lyman. It's you, David. It's you, Ben. It's you, Barbara. It's you, Tony. It's every single one of us living a fully surrendered life because when that happens, it turns the world upside down. When that happens, just imagine what would happen if all of us would live fully surrendered lives. It would turn the Poconos upside down. It would hit the Poconos like a tsunami wave. It wouldn't even know what was happening. So if you are new around here and you've never heard this talk, and you're, you're seriously wondering, what does it really mean to live a life fully surrendered? Well, let me explain it to you. The Apostle Paul said this, and he's speaking again specifically to Christians, those in the faith. And here's what he had to say. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves. Like, take some introspective look. You know, pop the hood on your soul. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. It's not for me to do that. That's for you to do that. I can encourage you to to do that. I'm going to encourage you to do that today. But you have to take that person. Like, examine yourself. See whether you're in the faith or not. He says, test yourselves. Test yourselves. So, if it's critical that we should test ourselves... And that, by the way, Jesus set the vision in the Great Commission. You remember that. He says, go therefore and make disciples, right? Make disciples. Disciples is simply a follower of Jesus. A disciple in our language would would be a fully surrendered follower of Jesus. So if that's the vision, we don't get to set the vision. Jesus already set the vision. Go make disciples. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And don't worry, I got this. I'll be with you. Even to the very end of it. Remember, that's what he said. So now test yourselves, if that is true, that we're to test ourselves, if that is true, that our vision that's given to us by our Savior is to go and make disciples, how can we know if we are one or not? Well, I'm going to give you a little way to take a test. So if you're taking notes, here it is, four-part test. Test number one. Here's how you, you know if you're a fully surrendered follower of Jesus or not. Number one, are you following Jesus? Jesus shows up on the side of a lake one day, and these guys are out there fishing, and he called out to them. He says, come, follow me. I will show you how to fish for people. And they left uh, their nets at once, and they followed him. Jesus invites all of us to live our life in a new direction. So my question for you is today, are you getting closer to Jesus today than you were yesterday, or are you getting farther away from him? He invites you to follow him. Jesus doesn't promise to fix your problems. He simply invites you to live your life in a new direction. And we know, we've been talking about this, that your direction determines your destination. Listen, gang, everybody ends up somewhere. But very few people end up somewhere on purpose. And Jesus simply invites you, come, follow me. Live your life in a new direction. He's not saying to you to live a life of perfection, He's saying, live a life in a new direction. Come follow him. Are you following him? Number two, are you doing the things that he did? That's the second part of the test. Not only are you following him, but are you doing the things that he did? Ooh, begs the question, what did Jesus do? Well, first of all, he was a man of the word. He read the Bible. He was a man of the word. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus had told a story trying to kind of hit this point home to read the Bible, to live your life according to the Word of God. He talked about two guys. They, they both built houses. One built his house on a sinking uh, sand, and when the storms came, the house fell flat. The other guy, he built his house on a rock, a firm foundation. When the storms of life came, the house stood firm. What is the rock? What is the foundation? It's the Word of God. So are, are you, you, you can't know the Word of God unless you read the Word of God, or you can listen. This year in my Bible study, instead of reading it, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in front of it, and, and it reads it for me on my, on my version app. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, and I listen to that, and it washes over my heart and my soul. Listen to the Word of God. Read the Word of God. That's what Jesus did. 
Listen, the will of God is found in the Word of God. So don't tell me you don't know what the, word of God, the will of God is for your life if you're not reading the Word. So you read the Word. Uh, the second thing that Jesus did, he was a man of prayer. He was a man of prayer. Everything he did was, was, was empowered uh, by prayer. And if we want to be doing the things that he did, we have to be people of prayer. Are you a man of prayer? Are you a woman, woman of prayer? Uh, you, you know, once Jesus was praying, it says this in a certain place in Luke 11. When he stopped praying, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Do you know that? It's the only place in all of Scripture that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to do anything. I don't know about you. If it was me, I would have been like, hey, Jesus, can you, like, teach me, like, how to walk on water? Because that was, like, really cool. And, man... <laughs> And, or could you like teach me how to like turn water into wine? That'd be cool. I'd be like the life of the party. Jesus, can you teach me how to like raise dead people, open the eyes of blind people, uh, open the ears of deaf? That would be awesome. Teach me how to do miracles. No, 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 no. They never asked Jesus to teach them how to do any of that. They asked him to teach them to do one thing. Teach us how to pray. Because somehow, after spending three years with Jesus, as they were following him, doing the things that he did, they were able to connect that everything he was able to do, it flowed out of this intimate time of prayer that he had with his father. Are you a man of prayer? Are you a woman of prayer? Read the Bible. That's what Jesus did. Pray. That's what Jesus did. Next, listen to the Holy Spirit. Everything he did was empowered and prompted by the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit's power, he performed signs and wonders. By the Spirit's power, he cast out demons. By the Spirit's power, he proclaimed the gospel and the good news. And he gave this final promise to his disciples before he left to go return to the Father that he would send us the Holy Spirit. In John 14, he says this, but the advocate, that means the one that's going to, you know, it's a, it's a legal term. It's like an attorney. He's going to argue on your behalf. He's going to defend you, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. He said, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come, and he's going to speak to you through promptings and whispers and urges, and as you listen and as you obey those promptings, you'll just be doing what I did. So, are you following Jesus? Are you doing the things that he did? Number three, are you becoming like him? That's the third test. Are you becoming more like Jesus? Here's what Jesus said. A disciple is no greater than his teacher, but everyone when fully trained will be like his teacher. What he's saying is, here's here's how we can know we're really living a life of full surrender. We're just becoming more like our teacher. We're becoming more like Jesus every single day. We're becoming more loving, more kind, more patient, more forgiving. So are you becoming more? Look at your life. Are you following him? Are you, test number two, are you doing the things that he did? Number three, are you becoming more like him? And here's the fourth and final test, and this is the doozy. Like, this is the big one. Are you surrendering all to him? Are you surrendering all to him? Don't take my word for it. Listen to the words of Jesus. I just want to let them speak for themselves. He said this in Luke 9. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Then he said in verse 24, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very soul? He goes on, he says this in Luke 14. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Jesus. Anyone who's not willing to live a life of full surrender cannot be my disciple. And gang, that's heavy. And I can feel it in the room. And that's why in this final test, we have to ask ourselves, What does it really mean to deny myself? What does it really mean to give up everything? And here's how, you know, we talk about that idea of denying ourselves or living lives of full surrender. We're not really living a life of full surrender if we hold on to four things. Here they are. My time, my talents, my treasures, 
and my plans, if I hold on to those things, if I hold on to my time, then I can't let the Holy Spirit guide me day by day, moment by moment, saying this is the way, walk in it. If I hold on to my, my talent, it means I get just to pick and choose who am I going to serve and when I'm going to serve them. I get to pick and choose what my gifts are going to be. And instead of God, he no longer becomes the potter and I'm no longer the clay. If I hold on to my treasures, I'm, I'm, I, I, I could do all these other things. I, I, could, I could read my Bible, I could pray, I could listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, I could join a group, I could join a serve team, and I could do all these wonderful things. I could even, I could even you know, uh, invite other people to come to church. I could do all these great things, but if I hold on to that one thing, my treasures, I become like the rich, young ruler who came with the same argument to Jesus, and Jesus said, go sell all your possessions and follow me, because he knew it was the one thing he was not willing to surrender. And one of the most heartbreaking scriptures in all the word is with that, the rich young world, he turned away and he left and it changed his destiny forever. See, if I hold on to my treasures, I, I, I decide not to, I decide not to uh, live a life of full surrender and I, and I put my, my effort into amassing more worldly wealth which only moth and rust will eventually decay and it will all burn up instead of laying up treasures in heaven which is true spiritual wealth, Scripture says. So listen, friend. Are you holding on? Is there something that you've got a white-knuckle grip on? Your time, your talent, your treasures, even your plans? You know, when Jesus was preparing for his departure, uh, his disciples got super upset. They were all nervous and they were scared. Uh, they didn't know what they were going to do without him. And they literally said, how can we know the way? It was in John 14. How can we know the way? Like, what's the right direction? What's the right path? It's been a recurring thing. I hope we all understand what the Holy Spirit's speaking to us as a church. How can we know the way? And Jesus said this, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. And I am fully convinced in my spirit, as I study scripture, that when Jesus said, I'm the way, he's saying, look, just follow me. Live your life in a new direction. Do the things that I did. Become more like me. Deny yourself and live a life of full surrender. And I will get you where you need to be. Everybody ends up somewhere, but very few people end up somewhere on purpose. Now, for, for me, I'm more of a visual learner, so just to help drive this home and we'll wrap it up. Would you go ahead and just grab your vision card? You should have received it on your way and it looks like this. Go ahead and just grab it. Wave it at me in the air like you just don't care when you got it. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Now, the vision of community church is everyone living a life of full surrender, more fully surrendered folks around here. And the vision has kind of two parts to it. It's got the personal part on the left-hand side and then the church part. And so for the personal part, I just walked all that through with you. Make a decision to follow Christ, to drop everything. Come to the moment of the cross and say, okay, I give up. I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm tired of living in my own direction. I'm doing my own thing. I'm going to do a 180. I was going this way, and this is what I used to think about you, God, and I was doing my own thing, and I'm going to do a 180. Okay, I'm going to follow you. Come, follow me. Now, next is decision then to, to be water baptized. Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father and Son. Make disciples, baptize them. And you look at the pattern of Scripture. Every time someone, as an adult, made a decision to become a follower of Jesus Christ, immediately they were baptized. And then it says, um, read. That's to read the Word of God. We call these soap journals. You write down a Scripture. You make an observation. You say, how can I apply this to my life? And you say a little prayer. And you do that every day. It takes 10 minutes. It'll be a game changer. Nothing will help you become more like Jesus than when you read His Bible you keep a, a, an account, a record of it through a little soap journal and you pray every day. Uh, and you learn how to pray. And then we call this seven seconds. Seven seconds comes out of a story I told about listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And I told this story about how the Lord had, the Spirit had prompted me to, to go into a store and I didn't know why and I decided not to. And then all of a sudden, I talked myself out of it like in seven seconds. And as I walked by, this girl came out. She'd been part of our church. And I knew I was supposed to go in there. I didn't go in there. I let the enemy talk me out of it. And she ended up coming out of the store to see me, and I had an opportunity to minister to her that day. So listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be fully surrendered. Now on the church side of things, we try to partner together to help us, as they did in the book of Acts chapter two. We call someone around here a VIP if you've been here less than four times. 
you are a VIP. You are a very important, the most important people around here. We love you, and we're glad that you're here. If you've got questions, keep coming. Keep asking them. I really believe that what we do around here on the weekend, uh, that's what we call weekend-only people. Uh, Weekend-only, maybe you're not in a group, you're not on a serve team, you may or may not throw a couple bucks in the bucket here or there, but you really love this, and we're glad that you're here, and it's helping you, Um, and, and you come once, twice a month, and it's really been a game changer for your life. But the next step from becoming a VIP is to commit to come on the weekends. And as you commit to come on the weekends, the next step is to join a group and get into a circle of friends where someone can help walk with you, shepherd you, teach you how to read your Bible, how to pray, how to have a soap journal, how to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and obey them. So you don't have to figure this out on your own. We can grow together in relationship. And then the next step as you join a group is to join a serve team and begin to surrender those gifts to God and use the things that he's given you, the talents and the abilities to serve him and his church and this community. And then the next step is to um, step into generosity and begin to surrender even your treasures. We call that becoming a generosity rock star around here. And it's just an opportunity for people to get into the game of generosity. We teach and we believe in the tithe, but we know that that's a significant thing for someone that's just beginning to grow in their faith. So this is an easy on-ramp for everybody to get into the game of generosity and letting go that white knuckle grip of greed on the things that we have. And we, be, we say it's generosity rockstar. You join our online giving team and you set up a recurring gift for any amount. Do we recommend $20 amount? Yes. Why? Because it's the average amount that the average American spends on coffee every, every week. So why would I want to give Starbucks more than I give my savior? But it, the amount doesn't matter. It could be a dollar a week. It's the, the point is you're stepping into generosity and you're doing something. Are you with me on that? And then the last is you become a fully surrendered. You're fully surrendered life. You're doing things in the personal responsibility. You're partnering with your local church family. And then you begin to invite others to come and follow Jesus. Does this make sense? This is the vision. This vision is you living a fully surrendered life. Now, here's what I want you to do. Take a pen. There's one the seat back in front of you. Grab that pen real quick. And on the left-hand side, here's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a box around where you are. You might say, well, I made a decision to follow Jesus, but I haven't been baptized yet. So you might say, well, I'm here on the weekends on the church side of things, but I haven't joined a group yet. So find out where you are on the journey. Draw a circle around it, a circle on the left. I'm sorry, a box on the left and a box on the right. Go ahead and do that real quick. This is a way for you to test yourself, examine yourself. Where are you? Go ahead and do it. You got a box on the left? You got a box on the left? Say amen. Come on, somebody, help it. You got a box on the right? All right, you're with me. It's just me and you, sis. All right, right now. All right, because you're with me. All right. Um, Now, here's what I want you to do. Find your box, go down one step, draw a circle around it. On the personal side and on the church side. Find your box, go down one step, draw a circle. That's your next step. That's your next step. You say, I don't know what to do. No, it's right here. I don't know how to live out this vision. No, you you can do. It's your next step. Now, as your pastor, here's what you need to understand. I'm trying to hurry because I'm out of time. I'm five minutes over already. Dear Jesus, help me. The Bible says as a pastor, the the word pastor and shepherd are the same thing. Those that are out in the pasture, tending their sheep, are shepherds. So pastor and shepherd are the same thing. Jesus is the shepherd. All of us as leaders are under shepherds. And the Bible says a good shepherd knows the condition of their flock. Look at me. Here's the condition of our flock right now. And this is what breaks my heart. Right now. Put up the shepherding report. We have 536 people, and if I clicked on that, it would tell me every single name. 536 people that have been here less than four times. We're trying to put a shepherding leader into their life to help them, because it's hard to go to church. Are they gonna love me? Are they gonna accept me? Am I gonna feel comfortable there? Do I know anybody there? So we have a VIP team, and we try to put a shepherding leader in their life to build a friendship and connection with them and to help them to come back. And say, come on back, sit with me. Hey, come on back. Me, pastor, come on back. 
Let me, let me introduce you to some other people. We have 536 people since Christmas right here. they have been here less than four times. Here's the next one, and this is what really breaks my heart. We have right now 2,981 adults. These are only adults. These are not kids. Almost 3,000 adults that are weekend only around here. You come here 1.7 times per month. You love this place, and we're so glad that you're here. But you're not in a group. You're not serving. You may or may not be giving. And it breaks my heart that for those people, and I can click on this link, and it'll show every single name when you've been here last. And my heart breaks for you because you are not experiencing what Jesus has said to living life to the full. And then we have over here, we have 352 people that are in a group, but they've not yet taken a next step to start to serve around here. They come on the weekends, they love it, they're in a group, they're in a circle of friends, finding community, being known and loved, but yet they're not serving around here. It's a consumer form of Christianity, not a contributor. We need to help you take that next step. That's your next step today. Then we have 226 people. They're on a serve team, but they're not in a group. So we got to back them up one step and put them in the group. And if you're here, if you're, if you're on a serve team around here and you're not in a group, you are the most likely to walk away from church, this church, any church. Because here's the deal. If you're only in a serve team around here, here's what you think. They only call me when they need me to do something around here. I feel used and abused by the church. No, 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 no. It's because you've chosen, for one reason or another, not to be in a group. Because that is where we have care. That is where we have support. That's where we're known and loved. That's where we grow in our faith. And nobody's calling you just to show up. People are calling you, how are you? We miss you. We love you. How's your marriage? How's the job? So you got to get the, those 226 people. We got to get you in a group. Or you may walk away from this church or the church. Because we don't want you to feel used and abused. There's no reason. Here's the other thing. We only have 16. This is the only one that's in green because we're doing pretty good there. We only have 16 people that show up on the weekend. They're serving in a group. Uh, they're part of a group. They're serving on a team. But we only have 16 people that have yet to step into generosity. It's great. Got to keep working on that, but it's great. And last of all, here's what breaks my heart. I've been doing this for 17 years. I've poured my life into this place. I preach my guts out. I lead like crazy. And after 17 years of ministry, we only have 316 fully surrendered followers of Jesus. That, my friend, breaks this preacher's heart. Think about that. To give your life's work to something. And only 316 people made a decision to live a fully surrendered life. So what are we going to do about it? Here it is. Grab this card. Looks like this. Go ahead and grab it real quick. It's a hard word, bro. I'm just telling you. It's a hard word. Can I get an amen? Jesus don't play. I'm just saying, what are you going to do about it? This is like the real deal. Some of you think this is just about hype and glitz. And... No, 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 no. What you're hearing right now is the heart of your pastor. All that other stuff this is the heart. So grab this card on the back. I want you to fill it out. And whatever your next step is, take it. This is living life to the full right here. And join the 316 people around here. What would happen if all of us right now took our next step? You join a group. Just join it. Right, so join a group. We'll contact you. You're going to put this in the bucket in just a minute. We'll call you. We'll get you plugged into a group that works for you. Your schedule, your count. It's like 20 meetings a year. That's all it is. Every other week, take most of the summer off, we get together for barbecues. Take most of the holidays off, we get together for parties. It's every other week. It's about 20 meetings a year. That's what your time is. If you're saying, well, I just don't have time. Who are you kidding? It's not true. You have the time to do what God has called you to do. And God says, we need to get together with glad and sincere hearts and meet and help one another. So join a group. Join a serve team. 
You only have to serve every other week around here if you're on a serve team. Start using your gifts. Quit just coming and consuming. How about contributing? How about living life to the full and saying, wow, God made me for this. You know what you're going to find? You will find joy and you will find purpose in your serving. And last of all, become a generosity rock star. This is my time. Join a group. This is my talent. Join a serve team. And um, become a generosity rock star. For any, for any amount, just start. I don't care. It's not the amount. It's just that you're taking that step to live a fully surrendered life. So fill that out. And here's one last challenge. And I'm 12 minutes over. Here it is. As your pastor, I can get this idea. What would it look like if over the next six weeks, every single one of us in, our church, in this church would commit to live a fully surrendered life? What would that look like? For the next six weeks, between now and March 29th, six weeks. It takes six weeks to develop a habit. That's why I chose six weeks. On March 29th, here's what we're going to do. We're going to call it All In Sunday. All In Sunday. We're all going to come. And we're going to be prayed up. And we're going to invite a friend. And, and, and it'll be an opportunity for us to live fully surrendered on that day. Surrender it all to Jesus. Imagine what would happen if we all joined a group between now and then, if we all joined a serve team between now and then, if we all stepped into generosity between now and then, and if we all invited one friend to sit next to us on March 29th, I got this great message. It's going to be the, a message of the gospel and give opportunity to respond, to accept Christ. What would happen if all of us, hundreds of us showed up and served on that one day? Because you're going to sit in service with them and right next to that person you, you invited and then serve with them uh, or serve in, in the in the other service that you don't attend. You know what would happen? It would literally turn the Poconos upside down for Jesus. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Grab your phone real quick, would you? Go ahead, grab your cell phone. I know you got them. Come on, grab them. Here's what I'm asking you to do between now and March 29th. Would you pray? Would you pray and say, God, would you lay somebody on my heart that I need to invite to come to All In Sunday and sit next to me? Here's why we need to pray instead of just go out and start inviting everybody. We need to pray because God is already working behind the scenes in other people's lives that you have no idea about and he will direct you to who you should invite. I mean, it could, and this is a dangerous prayer, by the way, because the people that ended up sitting next to Jesus, prostitutes, a guy named Judas that turned on him, but he also sat next to Mary and Martha, good people. He sat next to a tax collector, not so good, but God changed his life. We need to pray because if we don't pray, um, we might miss um, a universe of miracles because God's already been working behind the scenes and he controls everything and everyone. And it might be you need to pray and invite somebody that, that hurt you. Maybe you need to pray because God's going to put someone in your heart that used to be around here that's not around here anymore and they left. I don't know. They got hurt. I don't know why. Maybe you need to pray for somebody who's on the job with you. And right now, you don't even want them to know you go to church here. Maybe you need to pray, but it's a neighbor, somebody in school. Pray. And then here's what I believe we do next. We listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Because I just believe when we pray, God answers. And the, the Holy Spirit's going to begin to prompt you and lead you. He's going to tell you. He's going to bring somebody to your mind. He's going to be in Walmart. He's going to say, that person right over there, you need to go invite them. You might not even know them. But you're going to listen to the promptings, and the Lord will be with you. And then here's, here's the next thing. We, we need to pursue pursue those that we pray for and God gives us the prompting and then we pursue, we act and we invite. And here's what I know the devil wants to have happen. They're going to pray, you're going to listen to the promptings, you're going to pursue, you're going to invite them and, and, and they might say no. And the devil's going to want you to hear, I told you so. I told you they'd never come. I told you you look foolish for inviting them. I told you, I told you, I told you. No, no, no. Listen, pursue them. Don't let the first no be the only no. And the reality is most people say yes. Most people will say yes. And then be present. We need your presence here on March 29th. Can you imagine the person you've been praying for, following the promptings of the Holy Spirit, pursue them, and they sit right next to you in service. Can you imagine how cool that's going to be? They hear the gospel. And because you did the hard work of living a fully surrendered life, you could be the one that brings them to Christ. Can you imagine that? How amazing would that be? So here's the vision. March 29th, all in Sunday. You invite your friends. 
You show up, you sit next to them, and then you serve. And they see hundreds of people serving around here on that one weekend. It's a game changer. So if you'd like to go on this spiritual journey with me, go ahead, grab your phone, open up your text, send a text right now to 797979. Text me, 797979. And just in the, in the text, just write two, two letters, I-N, in, in. Go ahead and just send me that text right now. I'm praying for hundreds of you, hundreds in our church that will join me Becca and our team on a journey of full surrender to all in Sunday. So, you have your phone, you got your full surrender card, what are you going to do? Friend, this is your chance, this is your moment, this is your opportunity. No one knows what tomorrow holds. I mean, we all saw the tragedy of Kobe Bryant and his life taken such a minute, a second, life of his daughter and friends. Gang, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. This is your moment today. Live a fully surrendered life today. Start heading in that direction today. Fill this card out. Send me this text. Let's go on this journey today. What's it going to be? This is your chance. Oh, I'm too busy. I can't lead a group. Oh, I'm too busy. I don't have time to serve. Oh, I'm too busy. I, I, no, no, no. You're not too busy. The truth of the matter is, You have the time to do what God has called you to do. Oh, I'm too tired. Oh, I'm too old. No, 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 no. The truth of the matter is that you have the Spirit of God, His Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, and He will give you the power to do what He's called you to do. So what are you going to do? Stop worrying about the future. Live for the moment today. Step into this fully surrendered life. Start obeying the voice of God. Guys, this is our shot. This is your shot, it's your chance, your opportunity. Step into it. Because one step in the right direction might just be the biggest step you'll ever take. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I said everything I, you told me to say. Now I trust you to do in the hearts of people what you want to do. Amen.